All right, guys, how's it going? It's uh, Christopher Pack. This is the second dose episode of This Week in Art, art that I'm doing. Uh, basically, I am an artist that is working and living in Columbus, Ohio. And I thought it'd be cool to make kind of like a podcast type thing or a podcast. I, it's essentially a podcast. Uh, it's it's a, it's a video podcast that I'm putting up on YouTube. I originally planned it for Twitch and probably will go back to that once I have better internet so I'm able to like kind of stream it without it like disconnecting and stuff. But for right now I'm just kind of recording it then I'll upload it to YouTube. I'm also going to upload it as a uh, separate audio thing so if you just want to listen to it you can. Uh, basically what I am essentially doing with this is like I said I'm an artist so when you're in a chosen profession it's usually a pretty good idea to stay up to date about current news and events and stuff in that profession so I figured uh, I'm planning on at least once a week maybe twice a week if I get really good and going maybe three times a week uh, I'll do this, but I'm, I want to do this at least once a week to have something that's weekly out on YouTube, including my other content. But if I don't have other content out, it'll be at least, you know, that one time a week thing. Uh, but I figured it's better for me to, uh, what is it, kind of... Uh, keep an eye on or make sure I have a pretty good idea of what's going on like as an artist in the art community localized and you know larger like around the United States around the world so I planned on doing essentially kind of like in the moment research then if you're curious about fine art yourself you can also listen and learn as I'm learning, or if you're listening to the recording, learn after I learn. So, that's what we're doing. So let's get into this. So my idea right now is basically to kind of Google Fine Arts News and to see exactly what's going on. I might at some point in time also start putting in what's happened what's happening locally uh, around my area because I might start <clears throat> like posting and talk about certain I, I might do that in this I might do this I might do that in this episode but I usually have to pull up my Facebook and I don't want my personal stuff out there but uh because I might try to post what's happening you know if I get like this weekly thing out a rolling, you start listening to it, you can kind of hear about uh, upcoming, like, uh, you know, if you're in the Columbus area too, you can also hear about upcoming, like, art events, like certain shows that are coming up, or like opening receptions, or closing receptions, or anything around, or anything like that. Alright, let's get into it. Uh, I'm probably thinking about Doing, I think the last one was like 40 minutes, but I don't know. I don't really have a plan right now whether it's going to be an hour or three hours or exactly how long. I kind of want to like talk about is a formal art degree necessary for fine arts? Before I even get into this article, no, it's not. You don't have to be certified as a fine artist to be a fine artist. There are artists working artist that never went to art school I mean it does help I mean because when I was in high school before we get into this article I guess when I was in high school you know I was kinda my I mean I had a few art classes I think I did like a watercolor painting that won like a first place in like some kind of school competition or whatever so it was kinda cool but I really got into uh, actually 
like in high school and stuff, I really got into like I was in high school from around like 1999 to like 2004. And that's when uh like Toonami was pretty big on like Cartoon Network Cartoon Network on TV if you're like around that area, you know what I'm talking about. And one of the big shows was uh Dragon Ball Z. So I really got into watching that. So kind of anime in a way is my way into fine art because I started watching that and I started getting into anime I'm like oh maybe I'll be like a a manga artist or like an animator or at the time what I was thinking was a graphic designer I was like oh a graphic designer is a person that actually gets paid to draw because if you remember that time they had the ad where they're like oh we'll send you this thing for this art institute and they send it this thing and you have to like draw was it like a turtle's head or something but if you like, if you're older and you remember, they had like the art institute where you would, they send you a packet and you, I can't remember what it was, but like you draw the thing and send it back in, and they're like, so many credits and stuff. But yeah, so basically, I was drawing that. I'd even buy like Dragon Ball Z cards and get that and draw it out. I draw it out in pencil and then go back over and like ink it. I was doing some in color. Then also shown and jump started coming out around that time as well so I'd have like the actual this is like before the internet was popular so you'd have to TV and magazines and stuff or where you'd get I mean it was out but it's nothing like it is today I think I had a rich cousin that had it through like dial up and he spent like 600 bucks one month and his dad was like pissed because it like it basically go off your phone connection but anyway going back to that I'd get uh, Shonen Jump was coming out so I'd like that's how I first got introduced into like Naruto and One Piece although I didn't like One Piece at first because I thought the animation style was lazy but I didn't realize they were planning on making you know over 800 episodes which is I don't know how many chapters so I'd sit there and I'd draw basically like over those couple of years I was like building up my eye hand coordination and like drawing ability by just sitting there and drawing because I mean that's even like when you when I went to what when you go to art school you're gonna do a bunch of repetitive stuff to build up your technical skills but I had that so I was drawing that and of course like the family I come from was like poor so I couldn't afford college so I went into the military to be able to use a GI Bill. I was in the military for like four years. I got back out. Then by then, I'm like, ah, oh, maybe I'll be a cop. And I kind of, I mean, you, I kind of forgot. I mean, I know I went in to get the GI Bill. That was a big reason for going. But I was trying to, I was going to a community college because I was going to do two years of community college and finish out two years at like a university. I, at the time, I was going to get like a law degree because it's like that's one of the few things that actually transfer from the military is like law enforcement or something like that. And then at that time, I'm like, I was going to do that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to deal with people. I don't want to do the shift work where you do like 30 days, like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The next 30 days is like the opposite shifts. So I'm like, I don't want to do this. So I was trying to get into a history of rock and roll, and I couldn't. And actually what happened was I ended up having to take an art appreciation class because I had to take like a certain – because you go to college, you know there's like certain sets of electives you have to take. So the history of rock and roll and the art appreciation kind of like fell into the same thing. So I took that, and I kind of got reminded of – like, oh, yeah, I used to – I was drawing like four or five years ago. I ought to maybe pick that up. So I was doing that, and I remember, like, uh, the teacher at the time was Michael Kellner. And he was talking about, I can't remember the artist's name, but he was talking about drawing in, like, gold point. I'm like, oh, you can draw in, like, gold and silver. And I've, like, played around with uh, actually drawing draw, actually drawing in uh, silver point myself, which is kind of cool because it tarnishes and stuff. And... Uh, I can't remember what artist he was talking about, but I remember him saying, like, he'd do these gold point drawings, and they'd sell for, like, 35000 I'm like, fucking sign me up. Holy shit. 
of course that realistically that takes years upon years that time i'm like all right he's like if you want to come into a drawing class and just sit down and draw i'm like ah oh, i did that and i was drawing for like an hour i'm like how long is this last like three hour class I'm like all right so i sit there i can't remember if i stayed for just an hour or i stayed for the full three but it's like i got in there and drawing i'm like I like this because the whole then from there I started taking a bunch of the uh, the uh, like drawing classes because drawing one was just black and white then drawing two was adding color and it was like 2D design and 3D design and all that so then from there I ended up going to CCAD which is a private art school here in Ohio because the community college was in North Carolina because I was in Jacksonville North Carolina from the military and I spent like two years there going to that community college then moved up to Ohio to go there and it turned out being it's a private school that costs more than OSU but with the scholarships I got there because you can like submit a, a portfolio and get uh scholarships and with the scholarships that they awarded me or gave me or whatever ended up being cheaper to go there than it would have been to OSU so <laughs> long-winded you don't need art school but going to art school will help you definitely it'll force you to build up like technical skills like you'll be drawing You'll be drawing or painting like three hours each session, for like two to three sessions a week for just that one class. Then you'll learn like uh, fundamentals of color. I mean, obviously now, especially now, because I, uh, cause I went to CCAD from 2010 to 2013. I mean, even in the last, you know, five years plus, like stuff on the internet's like kind of the amount of stuff you can learn off YouTube and there's like certain websites or like master classes for stuff. Cause I've contemplated putting together like a, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to put together like, uh, some kind of, I don't know, like a drawing or, and a painting, like some kind of painting class. But the, the way I'd want to put it together with like a higher production value would be very, time intensive so but you I mean when you go there you're building up your technical skills you hopefully will learn about building up your CV and your resume and what exactly you need for like a, a body to a body of work instead of like having like you know a couple like random things like hone in on like a certain subject matter or a certain style of painting like I through there I kind of like developed this like kind of a like heavy oil paint palette knife landscape urban city setting kind of thing. You learn like all you need about you know ten to twelve good paintings for like a portfolio for a show. Obviously, you can have more, but when you shut up, like ten to twelve is like a uh, good amount. Then through there. Uh, you build up certain relationships with like people that also went there that can uh, benefit you later in life. If you just, cause getting jobs a lot of times is just who you know. But no, you don't need it, but it definitely helps. I mean, if you can get in free, like I know a guy I was working with at a screen printing shop. He actually got in on like a completely full ride, but he ended up quitting, which is that just sucks. But uh, let's go to the Tribune and see what they say. Since I just ranted for like thirteen or fourteen minutes on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> No, no, what are you doing? Then also one of those fine arts degrees is uh, 
what a lot of people will call a useless degree or like a liberal arts degree. But I have heard that like if you go for I know people that have like went for like and got a fine arts degree and they're like they don't make any art afterwards. But through the process of there's a lot of times you'll like if you have like a homework assignment or you'll have like a painting that you need at midterm or something like that. Then the whole class, you can do that, and they'll bring it in for midterm. That whole three-hour session is basically, like, going through the individual people's paintings. And basically, you'll have the class kind of, like, critique it. So it helps build up those skills where you can kind of point to what may be a problem and what you can do to fix it or what actually is working for it. So it helps to kind of build up those critical thinking skills, as cliche as that uh, sounds. Let's see what this says. The Tribune. Yeah, this came out like half an hour ago. Is a formal degree necessary for fine arts? I'm guessing this is Pervin Malhorta. Okay. Could you please explain what fine art really means? Is it necessary to have a formal qualification to be called a fine art painter? Isha a namdar uh, fine art refers to arts that are connected with beauty or which appeal to taste the term fine originally designated a number of visual art forms including painting sculpture and printmaking art schools and design schools still use the term to indicate a traditional perspective on the visual arts often implying an association with classical or academic art that's why nowadays there's like a uh, there's like fine arts, but also there's like illustration and graphic design. And it's fine arts is kind of fine arts is kind of almost like the outdated stuff that isn't needed in modern society. Like it's it's not necessarily illustration and graphic design and necessarily photography or videography or all that stuff, but. The word, f yeah, the word fine does not so much denote the quality of the artwork, but the purity of the discipline. This definition tends to exclude visual art forms that could be considered craft or applied art, such as textiles or graphic design, like I was talking about. The more recent term visual arts is a more inclusive and descriptive phrase for today's variety Variety of current art practices and for the multitude of mediums in which high art is now more widely recognized to reflect. At the degree level, courses in fine art are taught at the bachelor's, BFA, and master's MFA level. I have a BFA. I kind of want an MFA, but they're kind of expensive, and I'm still paying quite a bit for my BFA right now. <clears throat> While you can pursue a degree level program if you wish to study the theory and fundamentals of art in a structured manner or wish to go into academia, no specific degree is mandated. Neither is it the sole indicator of your talent or success. Many, many MFAs are unable to make a living from their own art and pursue careers in fields other than pure art while they are countless brilliant, untutored artists. Also, because I've contemplated, I mean, if I got an MFA, that's another two to three years of, like, dedicated time, like, working on stuff and, like, building intensely another body of work or something like that. But also, it allow me to teach at a college level and maybe get, like, an adjunct position, like, an adjunct position, which is kind of like a part-time teacher. I can go in and teach, you know, maybe, like, two to four classes a week, you know, make some money and be able to spend the rest of time working on my own art instead of working like a part-time job, <clears throat> moving 70 to 150 pound boxes in a hot ass fucking warehouse, which sucks. But uh, you know, then plus you'd be in you'd be in talking to uh other people that are like kind of, I don't want to say 
necessarily share the same mindset, but like, and the, they're like, art's the common thread. That's what I'm saying. Here we go. And as Indian art continues to acquire global recognition and value, this is a great time for gifted artists to foray into this field. Scope for commercial pilots. What is commercial pilot? Why are we talking about this? That just switch mid. So they're talking about being a pilot, which I don't care about. Hmm. I guess it was part of an article. Okay. That was weird. Yeah, I guess whatever this is, this is like a, what is this? Actually, what is this? It said the Tribune, but it seems to be, oh, possibly Indian site, I guess. The Donaghy Tribune online. Cool, okay. Oh, also another thing I was wanting to, uh, look at as well. What was I going to say? There has been there has been a group uh, if you pay attention to any politics or anything like that, there's like the Trump star on the Hollywood Boulevard was like attacked again for like the second, I think the first time was like 2016 then it got attacked again uh, then it got attacked again, like, a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if this, I think this is, I'm not really wanting to use HuffPost, but let's see what they say. But essentially, it got attacked again, and they fixed it, and, uh, it was a couple of days ago, maybe it was, yeah, I guess it might have been, like, well, this article's for last Friday, and it's like Tuesday right now. This article says the tenth, but this, from what I read, it'll probably say here again too that there's like a group of artists that are like conservative, that made these stickers that are like kind of the full size of the star. That, from what I can, from what I've heard and understand, they look kind of, obviously they're flat because they're stickers, but they look, you know, kind of like realistic. Of what the actual star looks like. Let's get into this. Pro Trump artist covers Hollywood Walk of Fame with Trump stars in protest. Rip up the president's Walk of Fame star or try to have it removed, and 30 more will pop up, the anonymous street artist said. And this is by Jenna Amatul. You know, actually, let me. Keep that up so I can think back to that. Uh, President Donald Trump's often vandalized Hollywood Walk of Fame star sprouted 50 some odd duplicates this week, and this was last Friday's when this came out. An anonymous conservative street artist told The Hollywood Reporter that he and his crew affixed the vinyl adhesive back stars early Thursday afternoon or early Thursday after a vandal last month obliterated Trump's real star with a pickaxe. And these are the stars I was talking about. So they're... I mean, they look pretty damn similar. Mm. The Trump-supporting street artist who said his crew is called... The faction said he spent $1,000 on the fake stars. He said the project was motivated by the destruction of the president's star on this week's vote by the West Hollywood City Council to recommend its permanent removal. Rip up the president's Walk of Fame star or try to have it removed like you're the mayor of West Hollywood or something. And 30 more will pop up, the artist told the publication. An onlooker said one of the stickers was placed over disgrace actor Kevin Spacey's star. Which is what well, you're getting more into the 
stuff, but like they have people that hate Trump and his policies and stuff. And they're doing that, but they also have you know I think Bill Cosby's star is still up. Kevin Spacey's is still there. So. Street artists created dozens and dozens of replicas of President Trump's President Trump's Hollywood star. They went to the Walk of Fame and placed the Trump stars over, overtaking the stars of pedo celebrities like Kevin Spacey, Rob Reiner, and Jimmy Kimmel. This is what this tweet from Josh was a gremlin. Because I think what happens is they have like. Say that one's like Kevin Spacey star in the middle of the middle, surround like the, what was it, like the eight blocks around him with the Trump star. Uh, the stickers were quickly peeled off. A Walk of Fame maintenance crew member said the workers began removing the stars at 5 a.m. Thursday and eventually found about 50 stars. The Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, which manages the Walk of Fame, previously said it won't remove any of the real stars, including Trump's, because they are considered a part of the historic, part of the historic, considered a part of the historic fabric of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Trump was awarded his star for his work on the Miss Universe pageant. The Chamber of Commerce said after the latest attack on Trump's star that it would, that it would immediately begin repair work. All right, and also from what I've seen, like the the backer may be uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, which was the controversial person that got kicked off of Twitter, like lifetime ban. But he, I, he, I think he's he's on Instagram for sure. I'm not Facebook. I'm not sure if he's on Facebook if he got banned from that or not. Because he was the one that was, uh, they keep calling him alt-right. But from what I've seen, he's like a, he's like a married gay conservative. But he's very like, what was it, controversial? Uh, he can be like very much in your face type of person. Mm. The one was, there was another one I was wanting to cover last time that same about this. Fine art without fines. Painted parking meters unveiled in Rock Island. I have no idea what Rock Island is. <clears throat> uh, this is looks like it's by Amanda Hancock. And this is the Quad City Times. Don't know where Rock Island or Quad City is. Uh, this was, I guess, originally posted on August 8th and updated on August 9th. What is this? Four permanent art meters can be seen at Arts Alley, an outdoor space next to Quad City Arts. Well, let's take a gander at some of these images, I guess. Get out of here, ads. Jesus. Yeah, stop seeing this. Because I don't want to see it. Well, get out of the way. How do I... Come on, get out of... Oh, well, we'll just do it like this then. So it looks like they're painting the parking meters. Or somebody painted the parking meters. That one's kind of cool. It's like a face. No, I don't. Is that an ad or something? God. They get you those ads. So there seems to be certain parking meters that are painted throughout Rock Island. I'm still not sure where Rock Island is. Hmm. Uh. 
A sign explains where donations to the art meters go. Oh, is this... Okay. So that may not even be like parking meters that they paint it. It's just maybe like random painted meters they're hoping to get donations to the arts. Get out of here. I bet if I read the article, I'll find out. Okay. Art is seemingly all around in downtown Rock Island. A stroll through 2nd Avenue alone displays colorful benches, murals, covering sides of old buildings, sculptures, and statues, including one resembling the dressed-up Blues Brothers near 18th Street. <clears throat> Another form of public art has recently been added to the mix. Parking meters. Don't be alarmed. These meters are for all oh, these meters are of the friendliest kind. A dozen unused parking meters have been painted by area artists and are now sprinkled around Rock Island inside businesses and organizations. Four of the colorful meters can be permanently seen in an outdoor meter garden built earlier this summer in Arts Alley, a space next to Quad City Arts, 1715 2nd Avenue. In addition to creative paint jobs, the meters were re-engineered to read Please Donate instead of Expired. When a coin is entered, the message switches to Thank You. Any money collected will go toward Rock Island's Citywide Public Arts Initiative. We don't see it as a massive money maker. Chandler Poole, the city's community and economic development director, said we want to get the word out about public art. I'm burping like crazy. Uh, the project comes from Rock Island Arts Advisory Committee and, according to Poole, falls in line with the city's 2015 arts plan which outlines the goals of expanding the arts program beyond the downtown area. The committee was inspired by a similar project launched in 2013 in San Mateo, California. We said, this is really neat and interesting, Pool said, can we do this here? At every step, the answer was yes. The Public Works Department had plenty of old parking meters, which Rock Island began removing in early 2016, on hand to donate to the project. The Q2030 Grants Program at the Community Foundation of the Grant River Bend offered a $2,000 grant. A call on social media to area artists was met with overwhelming, in quotations, interest. The completed meters were unveiled during an April Rock Island City Council meeting, and the meters began finding homes in May. Hopefully it catches people's eyes, Paul said. I think people will see them and be entertained by them and maybe want to know more. I don't know if I would. <clears throat> in addition to an outdoor garden at Arts Alley, art meters are displayed at the following locations during business hours. Uh, the Artery Quad City Botanical Center, Augusta Teaching Museum of Art, Rock Island City Hall, Circa 21 Diner Playhouse, uh, was that Ballet Quad Cities, Cool Beans Coffee House, Bike and Hike, Leaves on 14th. The meters, oh, this is a long fucking article, man. Oh, that's about done. The meters, according to Eric Reeder, executive director of the Downtown Rock Island Partnership, serve as another great initiative to make Rock Island the hub of arts activities in the Quad Cities. What are the Quad Cities? Are there like four cities, I would assume? Uh, next week, the outdoor meter garden is expected to be added to a map with locations of studios and public arts that displayed on several outdoor kiosk in Rock Island. The map is updated a couple of times per year according to Pool. An online photo gallery of public art on the city's website is uploaded more frequently as of this writing. The gallery features 55 pieces of public artwork. And Pool said, 
We'll keep adding to that. Why? What do I think about that? I think it's an interesting idea. I don't know how uh, effective it's going to be. <clears throat> I mean, who's going to really know about it? Then you're going to like throw a quarter in there, maybe? I mean, let's go to the, let's click on this. Oh, this is a Instagram. I'm still curious where this is at. Quality City Arts. Uh, this is still not telling me exactly where it's at. Can I open this in Maps? Mm, come on. Well, I guess we'll never know. I don't know. I mean, there seems to be a lot of like good intention, like arts initiatives, that kind of fall flat. I think there needs to be. Uh, going back to the last one too, I guess. I think there needs to be more. If you want to successfully raise money for arts programs, it needs to be done more in like a. Uh, I mean, how many people are going to be? This is kind of, how many people are going to be gracious enough to like kind of start donating money when like they're not really incredibly affected by it. I mean, if you're living in a small area and there's like public sculptures and stuff, and you're there daily, I can see you kind of doing it. But like for me, like right now, I can't afford to like live like in the city. So I'm kind of like outside of it, and it's just like apartments and suburbs and stuff, so <clears throat> I don't know. I feel like like with the last article with the, uh, like a lot of people assume that if you're an artist, you're liberal, which I, I, I guess you could say a lot of artists are liberal, but definitely not all of them. I would even go as far to say as a lot of successful artists, the ones that are considered successful, say, financially, would be ones that are uh, either they have really good skills and maybe a gallery picks them up and it's pretty good, or they themselves are more business-minded. It may be more on the conservative side and capitalism and free market, which apparently are like bad words to say to artists. Because there are artists that, uh, I don't want to say grant programs are bad, but this whole like government like subsidizing the arts thing is, I don't know, it like irks me some. I mean, I understand that it's hard to make a living off of art, but I mean, if you can't, I don't, it's, it's, it's a weird situation. I don't want to necessarily say if you can't make a living off of art, you're, you're, I don't want to say you're not an artist, but maybe you're not good at it, or maybe you're not business minded enough that if, uh, that maybe you need to become more. Like if you want to like do it full time, as an actual profession, you need to somehow figure out a way to be able to live off of it. Granted, there are I mean you hear about people that are rich and they live off the parents' money, or they're uh, what do you call them trust fund kids. I hear about that a lot. That like students that like that go to maybe went to Harvard or Yale or something like that. I don't know, it's just trying to be self-sufficient. I think you should go to be self-sufficient, is what I'm saying. But I know there are, like, I've recently come to find out more and more, there's like, I think there's a, uh, it's some kind of grant they give out, I think yearly, to, I can't remember how many artists. 
here in Ohio where it's like a what's kind of like an artist working living grant where they give you like five thousand dollars which would like I mean that would cover probably like half of year of like bills and stuff for me to get that then of course they have the Ohio is it the Greater Columbus Arts Council or something like that where they give out uh, well, they have money set up and they give out uh, like monthly grants to artists. It's like a $500 like supply grant where you put it in proposals, say, hey, I need, you know, I'm putting in a proposal to maybe there's like this certain project or body of work that I'm really wanting to do, but I need this $500 to buy like this amount of paint and like a table saw and woods and frames and all this stuff. And you kind of write up this proposal, and you give it to them. And if you get selected, they give you the grant money, and you have to like show the receipt. And you still have to live within the, the area, like within the next calendar year. Then you have to give them an update on about how it went, how the materials were used, and all this other stuff. But... I don't know. I know I shouldn't be shitting on grants. I mean, they're they're. I mean, it's. I mean, it's kind of like free money, right? I don't. It just. I'm trying to think if I've had a grant. I don't think I've had a grant. I've won like some small compet competitions and made money. And I obviously I like sold paintings. I just sold one a couple weeks ago. But, I mean, it's great, it's just, I mean, even as a business, like, that's, that's a great thing for a business to get grants if you can get it. But it's, I don't it, I don't know why, it just rubs me the wrong way. Alright, let's, let's do another one. We're about 42 minutes into this. How a fine art photographer builds relationships with collectors and, and curators. Uh, also August 10th. Is there not like a lot of ones that came out recently? I kind of want to touch on this one too. This would be interesting. To <laughs> All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Lynn Savelle's Taxi in Times Square. Uh, how a fine art photographer builds relationships with collectors and curators. August 10th. By Holly Stewart Hughes. Do you really need your middle name in there? Can't you just go by Holly Hughes? In our recent interviews with photo collectors for our story, What and How Photography Collectors Buy Now. Maybe I ought to click on that one too. One longtime collector noted that being able to meet and talk with fine art photographers often inspire him to buy their work. Side note. Uh, the paintings I ha the paintings I like the landscape paintings I was talking about. Uh, I've sell some online, but the way they're textured, it's better to see them in person. So I've sold like I've sold them in galleries too. But also another I'll get back to the article. Another good like if you're listening and you're trying to figure out like how to make sales like. I use like Etsy. Etsy's pretty good because you use like twenty cent a listing. Then they take like a small percentage. I it's like a really small percentage of the actual sale. It's pretty good. Uh, also, trying to do like it's kind of it depends where you're at. Like arts, there's like a huge uh, arts festival that goes on in June or July here, which I've been meaning to do but their deadline is like in December for the next year and I always forget like time management and planning stuff out is a huge issue of mine that I need to get better at to be more business like which is why I have a calendar there but uh what was I getting oh yeah uh online sales gallery sales is good but also if you can like get on a I mean, obviously you can Google it, but I know there's a pretty good. Let's pull this up. 
I know there's a pretty good website. I believe it's still Zapplication. Is it .org? And you can find certain... Uh, you'll have to sign in. But there are... Uh, I mean, there's tons on here. Basically, you, you sign in, you create an account, and you can do it within, like, so many miles of where you're at. And it'll get you, like, arts and crafts fairs and, like... All this stuff, because I've, uh, or I went to CCAD, I'm able to, I'm able to, uh, they have a twice a year kind of like art sell, where you go in, you like set it up Friday, then they have, I believe it's 8 a.m., or maybe it's 9 a.m. that it starts, till like 2 in the afternoon, where they have, it's probably like around 100 artists like set up on three floors where you have, you have a table set up. You got your easels, and you're basically sitting there, like selling your paintings, like face to face, with all these people that are coming by. And the last time I did it, I ended up selling. I can't remember how many how many paintings I made. I made over a grand in like a couple hours. So those are like really nice. Because I sold one of my big paintings. I've been like trying to show around for like three years and sold it. But like they were saying in the article. Like, really being able to, like, someone come by and they can see your painting, like, in person, like, in real. Like, be able to see it from all the different angles, you know, accurately. Be able to see the colors. Because depending on how you photograph it and, well, depending on how you photograph your painting and then what computer they're looking at and the color, like, the colors can be off just, even if you have it, like, realistic on your end, just... Maybe their monitor is off by the color. Or maybe it's too bright or too, bar too dark or whatever. But they can like, see it in person. See the actual size. Size is kind of an issue online too. So if you're posting pictures, have it like, I don't know, next to a quarter foot smaller roller or something like that where you can have kind of a size uh, reference. But they can actually like talk to you then ask you questions and maybe like what, why... Uh, what made you do that or this series didn't like you just talk to him and explain it like <coughs> kind of your whole backstory on why you decided to do that why you decided to do this series why you painted a certain way like maybe those like looking at it they're like oh, you know maybe then like looking at it you can like explain it to them which is where you know kind of communication skills come in handy you can actually like kind of sell them based on what you're saying so the art fairs craft fairs all that stuff is a pretty good way to uh even if you don't sell just like to have your paintings to have people view your paintings in real life and it goes on your resume cv that you've done that so that's a good way too let me get back to this uh, one longtime collector noted that being able to meet and talk with fine art photographers often inspire, inspires him to buy their work. He met photographer Lynn Seville after he bought one of her prints. I guess Lynn's a woman. I thought it was a guy for some reason, whatever. Uh, after he bought one of her prints at the annual benefit auction for the photo review, because Seville thanked him and invited him for invited him to an upcoming show. Seville recalls that after the auction, she got a letter from photo review editor Stephen Perloff thanking me for donating a print to his auction and providing the name and address of the person who bought her print. Seville happened to be sending out postcards announcing a new two-person show she was in. She mailed a postcard to the buyer of her print I put a note on it saying thank you for your interest in my photo and including her contact info. She says the buyer emailed her immediately. They corresponded and ended up meeting during the AI pad art fair. Also, too, uh, that little thank you thing is, like, very helpful. Because I know, like, when I, when I send off a painting, if I sell it online, like, I'll print out the order stuff, then I'll, like, I'll kind of write... 
either write a separate note or maybe like write it on a blank space like thanks I hope you enjoy it and all that stuff it's just little touches though she is represented by Yancey Richardson Gallery in New York City where Seville lives and other galleries around the country she makes an effort to market her work herself which you is very it's it's part of the reason I'm doing this if I let you in a little secret Maybe you, maybe you get to know. Maybe you get to listen. Maybe you get to see. Maybe you look at my art. Which is, uh, you can go to ChristopherPack.com. Uh, you can also go to my Instagram page that is specific for my art, which is Christopher Pack Art. There's also a Facebook page. There's Chris Pack Art. So some kind. So if you type into Google Christopher Pack Art. Or Christopher Pack, because my website's ChristopherPack.com. Yeah. I talk a lot. I usually don't talk so much for once. <clears throat> We're at 51 minutes. Where am I at? Mm, where are we at? Though she's... Rep Did I read this? Okay. Though she is represented by Yancey Richardson Gallery in New York City, where Seville lives, and other galleries around the country, she makes an effort to market her own work. Ads. I keep ads through Facebook and through Instagram. You can throw a few bucks at it. Because not, well, I just, I just did an ad the other day, but the one I did before it was actually of the painting they ended up selling. Whether I can't directly say that that ad led to that sell, I mean, well, there's a good chance you can have like direct click to and you'll say, but it, like I ran the ad and like a couple of weeks later that painting sold. So, you know, maybe, maybe not, maybe it's a coincidence, but you can like seriously through Facebook, through Instagram, I've even done ad like YouTube videos, you can like market those out too. You don't have to spend, I mean, obviously, the more you spend, the bigger reach you can get. But you can spend, like, 20 bucks. Then you make it to, like, specific cities. Say you want to, like, market it to Chicago and New York and L.A., maybe, like, bigger art cities. You can, like, specify the age of the person, uh, like, male or female. Maybe you get into, like, certain keywords, maybe certain business, where you can, like, really do like specific targeting towards people that's great and you can like do it at like a really good price too back to the article <clears throat> I have a great gallery she says and when a collector asks to see her work she appreciates the way the gallery staff shows and describes her prints It's just that I can't assume that everyone would think of going there and asking to see my work, she says, especially if I'm not having a show. In explaining her promotional efforts, she says, I try to go against my reserved nature and reach out when I can. She has attended portfolio reviews at Houston Photo Fest and other industry events and has found it helpful to follow up with everyone who takes the time to look at her work. Business card is really good when you're doing those things. After meeting a collector at PhotoFest, for example, she sent a thank you. He then wanted to buy several of her prints. She refers all sales to the gallery nearest the collector, she says, which helps my relationship with the gallery. Editor's note, reading a curator's advice on her following up on portfolio reviews here. Okay. Uh, because she suit, because she shoots commissions, makes art, and also teaches, Savelle keeps three separate lists of relevant contacts, including collectors and curators who might be interested in acquiring or exhibiting her work. She has tried using automated emailing systems that send batches of emails, but these days, she says, I tend to send them one at a time, adding that collectors and curators are more likely to open a personalized email. So having a collection and emailing is good if you want to have a newsletter, but like just blast it. I mean, what do you do when you get like spam blasted to you? you either like ignore it or you like spam it or trash it. 
So, that, I mean, there's certain ways to... I mean, really, if you're doing this, you just have to, like, jump in and just start learning things one by one and doing it. it it's going to take a while. How much longer? Okay, it's not much longer. Uh, Seville recently began inviting curators to studio visits to meet her and learn about her new work. I had to get over my initial shyness, which I, I don't have shyness. I have, like, social anxiety, so that's... But then again, if I'm doing it for work, for some reason it doesn't matter. If it's like personal stuff, I'm a little awkward. But if I'm like, if I have a purpose, I'm able to do it. I don't know why. Whatever. But there are, there are art. There are, I may have to cut it after this one. There are artists that are like very introverted. Like, I mean, obviously there's some, they're extroverted, like people, persons, but. A lot of times you think artists, I mean, something about being, like, being an introvert and, like, being alone and being to yourself actually helps to you, like, being in the studio and working for, like, you know, long hours by yourself. But then again, arts change where you can, like, go out and do interactive pieces, too. It just uh, depends on what your art is. Whatever your strengths are, play to them, I would say. Where are we at? I don't have a fancy studio in a trendy neighborhood, she says, explaining she lives in an apartment in Upper Manhattan. Isn't Manhattan nice? And expensive? I have a nice living room, and that's what I use as my studio. I just decided to start inviting people to come over, which I've kind of... Mm -hmm, we'll get to that. When she travels, she likes to set up an appointment with a curator. The National Portrait Gallery in London bought her portrait of an English poet after she contacted a curator there while she was on vacation. I just made a point to say I'm coming to visit. May I come by? So in Columbus where I'm at, obviously probably in New York and L.A. there are a lot more. But in Columbus, where I'm at, there are there's like 400 West Rich Street, which is like a a building of artist galleries. There is also I know a Block Fort has some in there. Also, I got a buddy that's in the uh, oh what is it now? I'm gonna forget it. It's like it's across the street from like Rogue Fitness. It's uh ah uh, it's like uh, he's gonna kill me. What is that called? Art gallery? Uh, it's something, something. Oh, come on. Uh, it's something Studio Collective. I mean, there's Phoenix Rising Printmaking, that's a thing. Oh, he's going to kill me. Uh, oh, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? It's a uh, 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 corrugated, corrugated. Here we go. Corrugated Studio Collective, I believe. Corrugated Studio Collective. Corrugate Way. Do I want to go into Facebook? Let's see here. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, there's like there's certain ones. It's uh the Corrigate Studio Collective. And there's there's probably more I don't know about. But for me <clears throat> I I don't know. For me right now, like I live in a uh I live in a two bedroom apartment and I'm using the bigger bedroom as my studio. I'm even contemplating like turning my the smaller bedroom like the one I sleep in. I'm contemplating like sleeping in the living room and turning that into like a video production room and get kind of like a pull out couch and just sleep out here. I don't know if I'm gonna do that. I mean, but before, I mean, I did live in a one bedroom apartment and use the bedroom as a studio and like slept 
I had like a couch in the living room and like a mattress like set behind it during the day and like at night I'd pull the mattress out and like lay it on the floor and sleep on it. Which was it was fine. It was cool. But uh where I use oil paints for the landscapes, I can't I it's not so much the paint necessarily. I mean it is somewhat the paint depending on what paint you have, especially if you're using like cadmiums and stuff. But if you're using like uh thinners and mineral spirits and all that stuff which I actually don't use because I just use straight paint and palette knives and like wipe it off with paper towels so I don't have to you know have like mineral spirits or any of this stuff to like clean the brushes which makes things a lot easier and less smelly but still to be safe I uh I have it in a separate room when I'm painting like I like the separate bedroom now has like its own bathroom attached to it and always like leave the fan like exhaust fan on in case I'm, if I'm in there and it's not horribly hot outside or horribly cold I'll have the window open or at least cracked or something too you know just in case but if you're just drawing or if you're working like with acrylics or watercolors or even like drawing or painting like on the computer you could literally be in you know like a studio apartment and have that stuff set up in there it's just when you start going into certain like uh oil paints uh anything with like heavy dust can be an issue i guess if you go crazy with uh chalk pastels maybe uh any kind of like spray paint aerosol needs to be separate and a mask would be good for that too uh I know even when I went to CCAD, they were, like, phasing out, like, stoneworking because of the whole dust and the safety stuff that they needed there. And they do a lot of stuff there, but they were, like, phasing that out. <clears throat> but, uh, I've, like, I've posted online, there's been, like, people, it's, I'm very paranoid of people, too. Like, just kind of having strangers come over. But I, I have had, like, when I lived in the bedroom, that one bedroom apartment. I did have somebody like come over in my studio and like look at and buy something. So I don't, I mean I'm sure if you're a social person, it's not that big of a deal. I just it also like <laughs> it may be like I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up like in the south, in the country. You know, this is my property. Get off of it. Get off my property. Like I'm very much that mentality. Like. Like, if you get on my property, you could be shot type mentality. It's, like, what I grew up in, like, in the country, kind of like, I don't know if you call it a farm. But, yeah. So, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I imagine if you, like, grew up in the city, like, your, your, like, personal space is, like, a lot smaller than people that, like, you know, like, live in the country. So, that may be part of it, too. But, uh. I'm like in the middle, of like re trying to reorganize my studio and getting it set up in there. And because uh, I was trying to get better internet for doing this and Twitch, and like live streaming while I'm working in there too, I think it would be cool. Because right now I kind of do like uh, record and make time lapse and put those up on YouTube as well, which is uh, my channel is uh, Christopher Pack. Just on, you can just type in Christopher Pack, P A C K. On, a, <laughs> on YouTube and it'll come up. Yeah, that may be something I need to do again. Have like a, well, the thing is, if I lived, because I know like I know a lot of artists that live like like downtown, downtown, or like the short north area, or like Italian Village, or like German Village, or like kind of OSU, like Clintonville, which is like if you're down around there, it's a little bit easier. I'm, like I kind of like live like on the west side. So I, there's like not really. I mean, I'm sure there are artists that live out here, but it's not like this kind of artist collective in this small like area. So we'll see. Did my recorder just restart itself? Huh. That's a little weird. I gotta figure out what's going on with that. I thought it was unlimited on this thing, but uh, maybe not. It's unlimited on this.
I was wanting to pull from the recorder and have better quality audio for that audio podcast, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll just pull the audio from here. Anyway, getting back to this. She has a nice living room. That's what I use as my studio. I just decided I just decided to start inviting people to come over when she travels. Oh, uh, yeah, we read this. Seville also works to place existing shows of her work in exhibition spaces. A decade ago, the Pensacola Art Museum in Pensacola, Florida, wanted to mount an exhibition of her work, but the deadline was tight and the staff at Yancey Richardson Gallery couldn't organize it. So Seville decided to select the images and write supporting statements herself, which seems like something she would do anyway. I, like, I'm, I'm not represented, or nor have I ever been represented by a gallery, so I don't know how that works. <clears throat> like, I mean, I've shown at galleries, but, like, ones that have, like, representation where you, like, they, they're like, you have a show here, like, once every three years. You can't show it in any other gallery within, like, a 50-mile radius type thing. So. Her gallery promoted the show on social media, but it's me doing the work, she explains. The museum in Pensacola ended up acquiring some of her prints. Then, through a friend's connection, Seville was able to contact a curator at a university gallery in Ohio. Ah, I don't like Ohio. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about Ohio, even though I've been here. I've lived here for like eight years now. I may move. I don't know. Gallery in Ohio, which agreed to host the show. I'm kind of curious what city now. Uh, Seville says she has since arranged for several other institutions to show her work and keeps contacting other curators she hopes will be interested. Institutions typically pay to ship the show, fly Seville in to give talks, or hold workshops for the local community, and acquire some of her prints for their collection, she explains. Uh, Seville says that when she has an opening or an article about her work to share, she sends it. Seville says that when she has an opening or an article about her work to share, she sends it to people she thinks might be interested but tries not to bombard people. And that's that whole don't spam the shit out of people or they'll fucking just quit listening to you all together type thing. She says. And she keeps the communication professional in extending an invitation to an opening or a studio visit to an opening, for example. I don't assume we're going to have lunch or long conversations, she says. I want their main thoughts of me to be my pictures. All right. So that's cool. So that's like four. That's four articles. So we're just a little over an hour. I usually don't talk this long. It's getting me. It's gonna be a little hard for me to talk now. Uh, maybe if I keep doing this, you know, you keep doing it, you build it up, you keep drawing, you get better at drawing, you keep painting, and hopefully you get better at painting. Unless it's me with a paintbrush, then it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so, all right, this will be the second episode of this week in art. Uh, I don't know what the actual title is going to be yet. Maybe it'll be something along. What's what's something sensational? We need some some something sensational. Because last time it was Facebook censors Picasso painting. Hmm. Maybe the degree thing. Maybe I don't know. Trump's always hot. Maybe it'll be that. Anyway, this is going to be the. Uh, this is the end of the second episode. If you made it all the way out here, good on you. I don't know how many people are going to listen all the way out, both in the audio or if you're watching this on YouTube, obviously you'll be able to see the uh, the articles that I'm looking at. If you're uh, listening just to the audio, <clears throat> I have the articles pulled up. And I guess with that I can put the article. I know on the YouTube, the YouTube. I know on the YouTube, like in the description, I'll link all the uh, articles. I may put time code too. 
but I list all the articles there. So if you want to like actually look at them yourself, you can just like click the link and it'll go to it, and you can read them yourself. And the audio, I'm not sure because I'm gonna like going to upload this or figure out how to upload this through Anchor, which will I think spread it out to other podcasting apps or sites. I'm not specifically sure how that's going to work yet. I don't know. But uh, my name is uh, Christopher Pack. Uh, let's see. Facebook is Chris Pack Art. Uh, my Instagram is Christopher Pack Art. My website is ChristopherPack.com. Uh, my YouTube. Did I already say that? YouTube, Instagram, website, Twitter. Uh, Chris Pack 1986. I'm sure I'm missing something. I have an Etsy page too, but you can find all that through there. But uh, yeah, this is this is it for this week. Week. So uh, have a good one, and hopefully, maybe I'll get better at talking. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, peace. See you later.